Shalom and welcome to another edition of Parsha Talk. I'm Rabbi Elliot Malamit in Highland Park, New Jersey at the Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation on Shemit. Joining me, my good friends, Rabbi Barry Chesler, Salman Schechter, Day School, Long Island, Rabbi Jeremy Kalmanowski, Anshay Chesed in New York City. It's great to see you. You know, before we begin, just we should start off with a Hakarata Tov to our many viewers and listeners. It, it's always, we're, we're so honored that you are with us. Uh, that you have chosen. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I don't know about you, Jeremy or Barry. I listen to a lot, and and the ones that I love most are the ones that honor the audiences, and just are are so thankful. So I wanted it's in in that modality of reciprocity. Uh, I want to honor our audience, our viewing and listening audience, uh, because um, you spend so much time with us, and we enjoy having you. And of course, we. Love talking about the amazing Parsha this week. Yitro, I, I, I want to say it doesn't get better than this because every Parsha, it doesn't get better. But this is really, you know, the, the, the great moment, the great moment at, at Sinai uh, that is is at the, the, the height of this Parsha. But before we get there, we have Yitro. So I want to, I'm going to open up, tee up the, the, the discussion with, with this character Yitro, we we've met him before. He's Moses' father-in-law. Yitro Chohen Mitian Choten Moshe. He hears Yitro, the priest of Midian, the father-in-law of Moses, hears about everything that God did for Moses and Israel, his people, and he brings Sipora, the wife of Moses, and they meet and. There is an exchange, and and it's it's an extraordinary scene here. Um, I, you know, I pick up one aspect of this scene and and talk about it, and and you know, you can fast forward if you want. I mean, there's a conversation that happens between Moses and Yitro about the organization of the of the people. But what do you gravitate towards when you think about this this scene and this meeting? So, Barry, I'm going to start with you. So, I what speaks to me is the singularity of the character of Moshe. Because there are two individuals and an entire people who are cast in relationship to Moshe. Yitro is Chotein Moshe, Sipora is Eshet Moshe, and Israel is Amo, his people. Curious. Translate, the, translate the, the, those uh, designations. So, okay, Jethro, Yitro is the father in law of Moshe, Sipora is the wife of Moshe, and Israel is described as the people of Moshe. And the one that's missing are the children, which are described as the children of Sipora. Shnei Vaneha, verse, verse 3. Right. And there's only one occurrence, I can't remember where it is offhand, where they're described as Bana. But everyone here is described in relationship to Moshe. And I think that it's important to keep in mind for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is it allows us to gloss over the title of Yitro, who is also Kohen Mijan, the priest of Midian. And he serves both a regional view, he must be one of the important people in the neighborhood, but he's also part of the family because he's the father-in-law of Moses. And we're going to have this interesting interchange because the architect of the judicial system of the Torah is going to be Yitro. He's going to tell Moshe how to organize you you pointed out to us before before we started talking that you know, the word choten in its various forms is repeated so often. I mean, it's I think we counted fifteen times in this chapter that he is the father-in-law of Moses, the father chotno, choten Moshe, chotno, etc. Um, and of course, you know when when a when a term is repeated as much, uh, the the Torah is trying to knock you over the head a little bit with this. Uh, with this designation so are you saying then that it's trying to uh magnify the lens on the relationship between moses and and kind of diminish his priestly status yeah i think so because yitro has a tremendous effect on the jewish people um you know one of the things that we don't often talk about when we discuss the difficulty of moses's job is that it is so physically taxing yeah. Right. You know, in the scene that we have in chapter 18, Moses gets up early and goes to bed late and all day long he's listening to people complain 
wanting resolution for problems because he's the only one who can interpret the word of God. And, you know, it creates a tremendous burden on Moshe. And Moshe himself is unable to figure out a solution. Nitro has to give it to him. And I think that we want the solution to come from someone in the family rather than someone from another religion. Well, does it make does it make sense for it to come from within? I mean, you know, is, is this a good model and archetype for, you know, some good ideas? You can respect wisdom from wherever it comes. So. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a great uh, a great saying of, of the rabbis. If, if they if, if someone tells you that there is chokhmah ba'umot, amen. If somebody tells you that there is wisdom in the nations, you should believe. If somebody tells you there is Torah in the nations, alt amen. There you shouldn't believe that, that the, there's a part of human ecumenical shared culture and wisdom that everybody should recognize. And then there's like specific things to this given religious culture that has to come from within. I, I think that what's being said here, I mean, obviously that's a, you know, that's a rabbinic comment and, and not in the Torah itself. But if we correlate the ideas, I would say that. Um, Yitro is is just speaking in the realm of excellent human wisdom, and Moshe, to to quote another rabbinic passage, is lomed mikol adam. He's he, he can learn from everybody, even the, the relatively surprising uh, uh, corner of of this Midianite priest, this other religion. Well, he's actually got something smart to say, and you should listen to him. Well, isn't it isn't it great that the greatest prophet of Israel? Is such a lousy manager of humans. That's right. <laughs> That's right. He's the archetype. So, I, I, so Elliot, I want to say on your behalf that one of Yitro's, uh, you know, wise counsel is not only the pyramid structure of, you know, there should be district courts and appellate courts and and you know bigger courts all the way up the up the chain of uh, of of, of uh, command, but he describes the virtues of. Uh, of who should be the judges. And you should go out and seek among all the people, valorous people, God fearers, and Sheremet, truthful people. So my bird's shul on Sheremet. That's why it's right now it says in your window, Rabbi Elliot Malley, it usually says, see it. HBC, it's, we, we merged the Highland Park Conservative Temple, merged with Congregation on Sheremet from South River and became the Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation on Sheremet. <laughs> There you go. So your people are the kind of, of truthful, honest people. So Nebata, by the way, this one is also very significant for both the governments of the two countries to which I have loyalty, uh, Israel and the United States, that people, leaders should be so Nebata. They should, they should eschew trying to enrich themselves. They're not, they're not in this judging business to try to get a, to try to get a little, you know, a, a little something to wet their beaks, and we all know that politicians and judges can 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 fit that bill, um, and and those are the people you want to be your judges. I, I love I love that Anshay Amet part. So it's, uh, chapter eighteen, verse 21, 22. So so, so it's interesting, um, Jeremy, to augment what you said that Jethro, the outsider, says you should be a Yerei Elohim, the fear of God, not a Yerei Adonai, the yeah. fear of the Lord, because. Yitro himself is a worshiper of Elohim, as will become clear near the end of the Parsha. So, you know, if I, if I fabulous, is, uh, another fabulous interpretation of Yitro's greatness. By the way, I just want to say uh, the, the 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 deep Jewish classic text, Prince of Egypt, the, the the character the character of Yitro, voiced by Danny Glover, tells Moshe to look at look at your life through heaven's eyes, which is a great great message to see yourself through heaven's eyes and the song is sung by the broadway star brian stokes mitchell who lives across the street from me and i have seen him in the grocery store and one time i had on my headphones i had that song was playing and i was with brian stokes mitchell in the grocery store and i said i'm listening to you right now singing look at your life through heaven's eyes that's only in new york only, only in new york, york. <laughs> only I said, brian stokes mitchell you might know this um uh, that Throughout the early phase of COVID, he would go out on his balcony every evening at five o'clock or seven o'clock or whatever it was and sing to dream the impossible dream. And oh, everyone would gather true. in the street okay. and listen to him until yeah. the cops told him he had to stop doing it because it was it was messing up the traffic. I, I think during COVID, I I, I I got out on my balcony and, and put my tefillin on with the rest of the minion on Zoom. Yeah, that's the difference between Highland Park and, and Manhattan. Okay. 
All right. So, so all right, if I'm if, to summarize, you're 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 gravitating towards the the relational aspect of 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 Yitro, uh, in in the fact that he is Choten Moshe, and the fact that that he has this this very um, interesting, significant appellation within within the text. And Jeremy, you're you're gravitating towards the content of what he's saying, and and this is a man who 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 knows reality, knows people. I want to just. The the verse I always kind of gravitate to is uh, verse nine. Vayichad yitro al kol So he hears everything, and it's it's a it's there's joyful it's a joyful um, phrase vayichad, which also has this kind of you know echo of yachad, but it's not the the shorish of yichad there is. It comes from chida or chadad or, or to be joyful. I think chedva, it's like it's like yeah, okay, to be joyful. But interesting, you can make a nice pun on yachad. So he he's he's happy for Moses, but yichad yitro al He's happy for the Jewish people, the people of Israel, and then he says, "Vayomer yitro baruch adunai," or as they say now, "Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, <laughs> Baruch Hashem, Baruch Adonai, Asher Yitzchak miyad Mitzrayim umiyad Paro." Blessed is God who saved you from Egypt and from Par- Paro and saved the nation from the hand of Egypt. I, it's such an extraordinary moment that here, this out, he's, he, he's an outsider. He's, 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 he's kind of in the audience. He's, he's, a, he's a minor character in the Torah. And yet uh, he gives us so much validation. I, I sense in Yitro something deep within the Jewish people, which is, we like it. We like it when Gentiles, non-Jews, people outside of our people, kind of pat us on the back or 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 wish good things for us. It goes beyond that. I thought you were going to read the next verse. Yeah. I now know that the Lord, yud Vavhei, is the greatest of gods. Okay, so... so it's so interesting. So he he relates to the human aspect of their salvation, and then to the divine aspect of God, you know, being God, and and that that shouldn't surprise us. You know, he, there is a machloka in the um, in the rabbinic tradition as to what what happens with Yitro. Does Yitro actually convert? Does he actually join the the people of Israel on their trek, or does he go back? And you know, in the Book of Numbers, he he returns. Right, he goes back to his people. He leaves them. No, I think he went to Beverly Hills, but uh, as I recall from my youth. <laughs> what was the sister's name? Ellie May. Ellie May, yes, Jethro. Yeah. Do you know but, any other Jethro? You know, one of the things that we sometimes forget is that the people are gathered at Har Elohim, the mountain of God. And it's the mountain of God because a lot of people worship God there, their own God. And now Jethro, Yitro, is recognizing that the God that you worship at this mountain is yud heh the Lord. It's right. not the God that he originally came to worship. I think there's one, one that's interesting about the point that you just made, which I think is is true. It's, it's Har HaElohim Chorev. Um, it is probably, I mean, you know, I, I, perhaps you've been, I've been to Santa Katarina, there's Jebel Musa in Sinai, um, and whatever i mean there, there's some tradition that says you know well, it's not the biggest mountain it's kind of a small mountain but it's a pretty big mountain but it's one of several mountains it's not it's not the only mountain out there um and now there's now there's christians and muslims and everybody's got a connection to at least that one place which we say it is but one thing that i think is interesting is that moses has just had in back in exodus chapter three at the burning bush at this site a private experience elijah in in First Kings 19, we'll go there and have a private experience, but Moshe is bringing the people for a public experience. And just, I don't have a, a particular thing to, to say about that, other than to, to kind of note that, like, it's not the same dynamic. Um, the special place, you know, is, is there some element of Moshe who's like, this was my place, this is, this is where I go to meditate, and now I'm bringing six hundred thousand of you people here. You know, is there is there something, or or is it like no, no, that's exactly it. That the place where individuals can have a special moment becomes, you know, broadened out such that everybody can have that experience. 
So, so let's move into that part of the of the story. That we will leave Yitro uh, and and his uh, reaction, and and they have a feast, and it's it's quite significant. But uh, we get to chapter nineteen in the in the parsha, and uh, it's the third month, Bachodesh Hashlishi, and they come to the Sinai Desert, Midbar Sinai, Vayachanu uh, Bamidbar Vayichan Sham Yisrael Neged Hahar. They encamp, Israel encamps uh, Neged Ahar, a nest to the mountain. And of course, Vayichan Sham Yisrael is in the singular, and that gives rise to that lovely um, uh, 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 interpretation by Rashi. They they were one one people, one as one person with one heart. Um, Moses goes up to God, and then God issues a statement Ko tamar yaakov, Yisrael, dasha, you say to the house of Jacob and speak to the children of Israel you saw what I did for to Egypt I brought you out on the wings of eagles I brought you to me now if you listen to my voice and keep my covenant you will be my treasured possession among all peoples, because the earth is mine. And you shall be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And that's who you speak to the children of Israel. So we've commented perhaps on this in the past, and I think that, that it deserves you know some attention uh, all the time, every year when we read this. I, mean, I would say you have in these three verses the compression of the story, right? I brought you out of Egypt. Yeah. Uh, you're here. This is what I want. I want you to no, come in. Yeah. I, I heard once, um, I heard once somebody, you know, one of those, like, you know, academic type philologists, I mean, it might have been David Marcus or it might have been somebody else, I don't know. Well, actually, Nesher in biblical Hebrew is, is is vulture so i took you on vulture's wings it doesn't have the same it doesn't have the same poetic music oh, I, mean, I brought you on i brought you to me on vulture's wings oh my god i tried to look this up actually to see if this was a, a fact and and um there there's there are some ornithologists that that have studied these things do do eagles eagle chicklets <laughs> ride on their parent their mother's wings but um so obviously, it's well, a- the explanation is that the difference between the eagle and the other birds is the other birds carry the young in their feet because the attack is going to be from above. So the mother is going to be between the children and the attacker, whereas the eagle is going to be attacked by below. That's why the the chick- but you know, the, 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 that is a, the explanation that you want often hears. But we also have in Ha'azinu, it's it's. Kinesher Yair Kino Al Gozalav Yirachet that the that the eagle flutters above um the gozalim in the nest, the chicklets in the in the in the in the nest. So even there the Torah doesn't seem to have that explanation. I, I think it could be just like poetic. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be like a tight metaphor of how birds right. protect the young. But, it just means, you know, it's interesting. I saw it. It also obscures what the metaphor means. What does it mean that God brought them out on wings of eagles? He took them out spectacularly in, in this soaring way. So so I, that's a good question. And, so and, how do you... Wait, 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 wait. Part of my research on this, it was the eagle, the eagle, the, 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 the young bird. This is what I remember reading. That when the, the, when the little chick begins to fly, it falls down a lot, okay? And it could it could leap off of a cliff and not know how to flutter, but the the mother bird is hovering over. And when the bird, the parent bird, the mother bird sees the young bird falling, that bird will swoop down and pick that bird up. That's what's going on. Is that true? Is that like a true fact? I, I think so. It's true. <laughs> so that supports the reading in Hazinu, but how does it work here with the Exodus? So is the enslavement experience then akin to 
they're falling they're falling, falling down. they're falling off a cliff there it's 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 a it's a point of catastrophe and god extricates and god, them from their fall exactly exactly i think that that's well, that's actually a, that's actually a lovely um, that's very nice you know lo lovely metaphor for you know divine leadership through this yeah, crisis source i i want to um i, I want to you know, the, the whole story took you out of Egypt, brought you to me, and we're going to make this covenant. Uh, we cannot possibly overstate how important covenant is in religion, in, in this religion, uh, not all religions necessarily, but in this religion, covenant. It's covenant. We make a deal with our fellow Jews. We make a deal between our community of Israel and God. Uh, we have mutual commitments. There, there's nothing that we can all do alone. We have to do it together. And the 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 plan is, as as you said, um, you heed my voice, and you you heed my covenant, and then what will you be to me? Mamlechet Kohanim v'goy kadosh. This is the, uh, this is the, the telos, this is the whole point, that you shall be a kingdom of priests, that is to say priests, not in the sense of uh, necessarily um, uh, leaders or, you know, you, you got the, the fancy job, or you get the fancy outfit, but you are servants. You are worshipful servants. A whole, a whole uh, a kingdom of people who will be um, worshipful servants, and that's serving the world, serving others. The goy kadosh and a holy nation. And you know, like we we in Judaism, beleaguered people that we have been for many centuries and through the twentieth century in particular, with all the terrible things that. That happened in the Nazi period, in the Soviet period, and back in World War One before that, and and the assimilation, and you move to Western countries, and everything is different, and we, we've got to survive. We have to survive for the sake of surviving. You know, I don't really, uh, I'm I'm in favor of us surviving, but I'm not surviving for the sake of surviving. I'm I'm in favor of flourishing and surviving to be mamlechet kohanim, to be a, a nation of people who serve the world, who who try to improve the world. We've got a real goal in keeping the mitzvot, a real goal in keeping the covenant. And it it's it's to serve God and to serve okay. God and to serve God's world. So so the Torah really does not give us the details in this moment of what it means to be a Mamlachat Kohanim. And what you're saying is that it means to to serve God or it means to to there there is a certain kind of agency here that that the people are, are to function as a as a kind of agency for for God in the world, and and that that mission, and we used to talk about this all the time. That mission is kind of lost on on contemporary Jews. They they don't they don't focus themselves on um, bringing God to the world. You know, it's so so interesting when when Queen Elizabeth died. Uh, I made the point of of commenting on the crown and that the crown was a physical thing, and that the crown was affixed to her coffin and that at the moment that she was interred, they had to take that crown off and put it somewhere special. And, and in a couple of months, it's going to be placed on Charles's head. The point is that the crown is a tangible, tangible symbol. Whereas for Israel, we have the name of God, which is intangible. And Israel is the kind of vessel of God's name, bringing God's name to the world. And, and to be a Mamlechet Kohanim, a kingdom of priests is to be, you know, act in a certain way that you are constantly, you know, uh, mindful of that name and bringing that name to the world um, and, and, and enabling people to, to see the name of God or to hear the name of God or hear at least the voice. I want to suggest a slightly different reading. So, you know, the Vav is often very difficult to translate in biblical Hebrew. And I want to suggest that here it functions as a colon that the definition of Mamlachet Kohanim is Goy Kadosh, that you become a kingdom of priests by becoming a holy nation. And, you know, in addition to the idea of service, Jeremy, which you mentioned, the other thing that we know about Kohanim, and especially the Kohen Agadol, is that they are completely dedicated to life. There's a restriction on their mourning rituals and their treatment of the dead. And I think it's is an attempt to say something about how the Jewish people are to function in the world, that they are supposed to bring life to the world and not death. And that's part of being this holy nation. All right. So let's go to the Ten Commandments now, which is really the, 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 um, the, 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 the great moment of this Parsha, that God reveals uh, to Israel, 
and by way of Israel to humanity, these 10 statements. And of course, it, there's tremendous scenery, the tremendous you know, sound and light and, and all sorts of power at this time, which we could talk about. But the, the, the text of the Ten Commandments itself deserves so much attention in terms of how it is, you know, just how it's shaped. I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this in terms of like the number of words in the Ten Commandments, 172 words in the Ten Commandments. There are 170 words on a mezuzah. Shema Yisrael v'hafta and v'ayam Shema. If you count up all those words, there are 170. Could it be that the Ten Commandments functions in that kind of way, I don't want to say in an amulet way, that is to say, you don't put it on your doorpost, although who knows, maybe they put it they put it on their doorpost. I don't, I don't know if there's a source for that. What I would suggest is the opposite may be true, that originally it may have been the Ten Commandments. That because would... as we know, and often don't think about, the Shema itself is an artificial text. It was created from two or three biblical texts that were put together from different places. And the Ten Commandments has always been a unified text. Okay, and and of course there are two separate kinds of texts. One is like the 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 foundation of of civilization, and one is really a profession of 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 faith and and the the posture that one has to have. Um, well, I mean, at the, at the at the risk of saying the obvious, the two passages from Deuteronomy six and eleven say yeah. you shall write this on the doorpost of your house, which is so that's why we have the artificial text. Uh, but I think it, it really does surprise me that you that what well, you discovered when you counted up the number of words, which I had no idea. Um, it, it is the kind of thing that makes you at least open to the possibility that the uh, various, you know, dik du queso frame, the, the, the fine points of the scribes, um, really aligns some things to make them the same number of words. I, 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 it's probably not. You know, just a coincidence. Okay, it's probably not. Yeah. So, so here's what I want to I want to suggest the following: uh, the iconography of the Ten Commandments, which we have, you know, in, in everybody's synagogue. I don't know, Jeremy, having your shul, yeah, you know, got two tablets, you know, in the front. I mean, I, it's somewhere in my shul, I'm sure, right on the door or something. It's it's not. We don't have it in the in the in the sanctuary, um, but you know, you I have know, I have it I have it over the ark. Over the ark, the chapel and the sanctuary also have on a stained glass at the top, and and in the one in the stained glass, there's a typo. Yeah, a typo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah All right. So so so, I, I'm thinking that the iconography of the Ten Commandments and placing them as an image actually distorts our understanding of the Ten Commandments. Now, in fairness, so the iconography has. Commandments one through five on one tablet, and commandments six through ten on the second tablet, which I don't think is is the way to go. I think there were two two tablets. There were two copies of the whole thing. Boom. Okay, you can well, we can debate that another time. But but if you read the text, 172 words, the middle of the text, the largest commandment of the Ten Commandments, 55 words, is commandment four. Zahor Yom Shabbat Likotcho. And I want to say that it shouldn't surprise us that Shabbat is stands out in terms of its quantity, its prominence, um, the the degree of detail that the Ten Commandments text takes to, to describe Shabbat. It shouldn't surprise us. Look, Lotir Tzach, don't murder. It doesn't tell us about that. It doesn't tell us about how not to misuse the name of God. It doesn't tell us anything about you know the details of of uh you know, honoring your parents but when it comes to shabbat it's the whole you know your whole clan is to observe shabbat because god you know created the world because god rested because so the the predominance of you know focus in the 10 commandments on shabbat significant talk about that <laughs> So, as I suggested when, before we were recording, that this is the one commandment that we observe in the same way that God does. So, God rested at the end of creation, at the end of the week, as it were, and we rest too, just like God did. The other commandments don't have that same symmetry between what we do and what God does. And, you know, when you put up the 
chart or that picture for us, Elliot, before we recorded, the middle two words are called Malach Tacha, all work, which resonates with the creation story. So that we have these two major themes of the Torah, creation of the world and Shabbat, being redirected to the Israelite people with the giving of the Ten Commandments. So, Jeremy, in, you, uh, in, in gravitating towards this commandment, I mean, I wanted to ask you, like, what 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 do you think what do you think is going on here and, and, or what's shaping your understanding you know coming out for you uh, as you read why it's why it's so why it is takes the lion's share of the attention yeah well i mean i think that um it, it's you know true that in the practice of judaism like shabbat is the most important thing that everyone does or you know not not nowadays that everyone does necessarily, but the the cultural meeting place, the cultural um, deep meaning is that we have this cycle of work and rest that it affirms. Um, speaking of you know the the sense of covenant and and partnership, mutual obligations between God and Israel, it affirms that you should spend six days making the world better, working to improve the world, working to fix the world's problems, achieving building, creating, doing, all those things. We have great capabilities, and in this religion, God expects us to use them six days a week. Six days a week, we we sense what we can do to, to be that servant. And, and we also have the pulse of silence and stillness that enables us to, you know, sort of be at one um, with a cosmic order that is beyond whatever the things that we can accomplish. So I, I think that Shabbat is is wonderful on that level i also think it's you know not a coincidence perhaps that in the practice of shabbat what what jews have said through the centuries is is kind of like you know what don't go more than a week without a feast whatever it is that you have to do you shouldn't go more than a week without a party and get together with your people and and celebrate at least once a week no matter how hard stuff gets if you do that um, I think you'll you'll retain that life affirming, joyful, uh, you know, sense that that this religion wants to give you. It would it would it's it's so fascinating, you know, that Shabbat is the one of the most important defining features of of Judaism. We 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 have six hundred thirteen mitzvot. We could talk about any single one of them. We could talk about you know my favorite you know non significant mitzvah, which is you know do not you know or place a guardrail around your roof, right? Make, right? Judaism is not defined by putting a guardrail on your roof, but Judaism is defined by Shabbat, right? That, that, and, and, you know, the, 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 the rules, the laws, you know, they could, they could drive you crazy. They could drive anybody crazy, but they, they have as a goal of, of creating a different kind of sense of space and a different kind of sense of time in a different kind of environment, you know. It really, it really feels like Shabbat. We were talking about this before we started recording. the The necessity of Shabbat, modern people or contemporary people, should really feel it because I, I've uh, I've told the story. Maybe I even told it on a partial talk, um, but I told the story many times. I, I was once in, in New York here before I came to Anshach. I said it was like speaking at a shul. And I was walking home from that synagogue with with one of the members, and this is back in the day when there were lots of Korean grocers on every every corner. There was like these little small bodega like grocery stores, and the person I happened to be walking with, who I wouldn't wouldn't know, I just met her that day in the shul. Um, walked past one of these stores, and and whatever it was, artichokes, you know, you know, two for a dollar or whatever it was. She, she goes, oh, two for a dollar. I can't pass that up. And I thought to myself, wow, that is the best illustration. Of Shabbat that I've ever I could ever have the that thought that I can't, this story. I can't pass this up. No, actually, what Shabbat means is you can and must pass this up to to get that sense of beautiful Zen stillness that comes from from you know being a Shabbat observer. Well, the the creation of the boundary, the creation of a zone, and the creation of a you know a zone in 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 space and time and a zone in i guess in your own soul and in your own community i mean you you spoke about the fact that that you know there, there's nothing that has sustained the jewish people throughout its history more than shabbat and and 
probably you could ask, add, there's nothing that has given Jews, even in the depths of their poverty, a sense of their own dignity that that for one week they could they could sit, you know, and and be something other than they are. Uh, David Hartman, Rabbi David Hartman, who's your was, you know, 10 years ago, he died, it's the 10th your site. So he talks about this kind of dignity, the dignity of otherness, that that on this one day you are other, that the, the six days that you talked about, the six days that we are commanded to work, Shesha Jamim Tavod, you are, it's a commandment to work, that for six days you get your dignity through, you know, acting on creation, and the seventh day you get the dignity by being in unison with a, another set of rhythm. I think that, that gives uh, tremendous meaning here. So to that point, what I would add is that Shabbat gives us an opportunity to think differently about what it means to be human and what it means and what the divine means. So in our quest for the divine on Shabbat, we actually find ourselves more human. And that's the real blessing, it seems to me. So then what, what I want to read into that is that, so the Ten Commandments then, if this is at the core of the Ten Commandments, it's the the Ten Commandments are asking you to be human. To, to, in the fullest aspiration of your humanity should include, must include, this kind of imitation of God and this kind of behavior. That's what the Ten Commandments is about. I, I, totally correct. I think that uh, this is um, profound because each of the things, the manifestly human ethical things, you know, it, it's, it's not that you can just boil... I mean, we have plenty of midrashim that say the whole Torah can be derived from the Ten Commandments or whatever, but um, each of these ten things is a profound statement about what it is to be human. For religious people, it means revering the true God and not and not you know falling into the seduction of false gods and not, no idol worship. Can't 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 overstate how important Judaism's re rejection of idol worship is. You, you can't use God's name. In vain, meaning you can't lie in God's name and you can't swear but evil swear, in God's name. Swear yeah. to 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 um, to uh, you know get get something over by swearing falsely in God's name. You have the rest, the polarity of work and rest we're talking about. You have family relationships and honoring your parents and being grateful for your own life. And then you have the the, the no killing and the no adultery and the no stealing and the no uh, the no false witnesses. And the non-coveting, which is really the, the one of these things is not like the other. Um, the other, the others for the most part have specific behaviors. Coveting seems like a feeling, or perhaps it's you no know, scheming to get the things that you covet. Um, but there's a, there's a great midrash, which you know you're talking about the iconography and the way it 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 hides certain figures, certain features of the Ten Commandments, and 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 obscures certain features, and maybe maybe brings out others. There's there's a wonderful midrash that says. You know, that, that does like this is where we get the iconography. There's five and five, and they they correlate. Um, I am the Lord your God. Goes with do not murder because okay because the human beings are created in the image of God. So if if I am the Lord your God, I am also manifest in humans, and you got to care for each other's lives. No false gods translates to no adultery. You got to be loyal to who you're loyal to, and not and not uh, try to get try to get a little. Sort of the little god on the side, um, and then the other ones go like, uh, "No, no name in vain is like no stealing, because somehow you're taking God's name to get get ill-gotten gains." And then the rest of the midrash is not quite as good. Shabbat goes with no false witnesses. In fact, what do we do? We testify to God's creation of the world when we make kiddush. And then the last yeah. one is honor your parents. Goes with covet. I don't remember how that actually works. Uh, I don't remember what what the what the. You shouldn't covet your parents. No, you shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't. You shouldn't wish. You shouldn't wish that uh, you know somebody else was your parent. <laughs> All right. All right. Look, it, it's it's um, what we what we we've just scratched the surface on this, and of course, you know the 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 Ten Commandments really ought to be the most you know ought to be studied and and understood. We 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 have this problem of of reciting it and and. You know, need to need to delve into it as deeply as possible, which we've tried to do in our parsha talk here, and talking about Yitro and talking about Mamat Har Sinai and being a goy Mamlechet Kohanim and goy Kadosh, and so we are very very thankful that you have been with us for these last few minutes. I'm going to Israel this week, going on Sunday. Let's see, 
And uh, our next Parsha talk will 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 be you know pre recorded, obviously, and uh, it'll be great to to be where we are. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all and everyone. Have a wonderful Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. Thanks Shabbat Shalom.